Hello, and welcome to If Guitars Could Speak, the web series where we examine one iconic piece of gear, musician, or moment from rock history. Today we will be delving into the archives, however, when we look at Paul McCartney's Hofner bass. But many people don't know that there are actually a few different versions of the famous Beatle violin bass. Now, Paul is not known to suffer from gear acquisition syndrome. When the guy finds a bass or guitar he likes, he keeps it forever. But that doesn't mean there aren't some interesting stories behind his gear. So we will dive into four different bases that were connected with McCartney over his career. And remember, if you like content like this, please don't hesitate to like this video with a thumbs up and subscribe to the Guitar Historian channel. Now with that out of the way, let's take a look at the Beatle bases of Sir Paul McCartney. In April of 1961, the Beatles started their second residency in Hamburg, Germany. After being deported for lighting a condom on fire and an ignominious end to their first residency, Pete Best's mother Mo had to write to the German government promising that the boys would behave themselves if they were given another chance. At the same time, John's art college friend Stuart Sutcliffe was the bass player in the band, but he made it clear that the fun was over as he had a promising career as a painter ahead of him and the band knew that someone would have to play the bass permanently. John and George looked at each other and then they both looked at Paul, who knew he was the odd man out. After temporarily converting an old Rossetti guitar into a makeshift three-string bass, McCartney knew that he would have to buckle down and get himself a proper bass after he dropped the Rossetti and the band took turns jumping and stomping on it. One day, Paul passed by a shop in downtown Hamburg, and in the window was a bass that caught his eye. On the second floor of a Steinway shop, salesman Gunther Oper would sell Paul McCartney his first Hofner 501 violin bass. He even had to ride the bus back to the club with Paul to get his passport to close the deal. Paul ordered a left-handed version specially from Hofner. There is some evidence that this bass was in fact specially made just for Paul by Hofner. The Beatles' British stablemate Tony Sheridan, whom they would back on an album featuring My Bonnie, believed it may have been the first left-handed bass Hofner ever made. He said, this would have been a special order direct from Hofner. As there were next to no German rock musicians around, there was no demand for anything much in the way of quality instruments, let alone a left-handed bass. The bass was not known as a workhorse, however, with the light, hollow body making it somewhat fragile. It was, however, easy on the back and hands, and Paul found the thin, quick neck more amenable to his time as a guitar player. Paul would play the bass with the controls set to the neck or bass pickup, and the rhythm solo switch set to rhythm, which gave the bass its deepest, most powerful bass sound. Paul would use this bass exclusively on all Beatles shows and recordings after the middle of 1961. This was the bass Paul used to audition for Decca Records and George Martin. It was the bass used on the Please Please Me album with the Beatles, A Hard Day's Night, and all the early singles but the bass would start to show some wear and tear by early 1963, with the front pickup being held in by cello tape, as Paul called it. At some point before the Royal Command performance on November 4th, Paul took possession of a second Hofner violin bass. This was a 1963 model with a slightly different pickup configuration than his 1961. This is the bass that Paul still owns and uses to this very day. Most would say that the 1963 violin bass is the most famous, and they may well be right. But Paul's first was the 1961 version. In 1964, Paul would actually be presented with a third Hofner violin bass, this one a one-off special model with gold plating that was to be a gift to Paul in return for using his likeness on the Hofner violin basses that were sold due to the Beatles' popularity. Hofner's UK distributor, Selmer, had a photo opportunity with Paul receiving the bass, but he didn't actually leave with it. It was to be displayed in an upcoming British music trade show later that year, after which they would send it to Paul. The strange thing about this gold plated version, however, is that Paul never actually received it, at least not at a time that he was photographed using it. According to Andy Babiuk's Beatles gear, it was apparently sold to another left-handed British bass player named John Bunning. Bunning went on a search for a left-handed bass and found them very hard to come by. 
Initially, the local music store modified a right-handed Hofner violin bass for Bunning, but he wasn't satisfied with the final product. Later that year, the music store called Bunning to tell him that they could order a left-handed bass for him, but that it would take two months to arrive. He agreed and waited patiently for his prize to arrive. Later when the music store called back, they informed him that the bass would be a little more expensive because it had gold hardware. The manager told Bunning that the bass was very special because it had been made for Paul McCartney, but was a, quote, spare. Bunning later claims that he contacted Paul and was told by an aide that Paul believed his story that it was the bass that was meant for him. However, it has been impossible over the years to fully corroborate the story, and the bass has failed to sell on Beatle-related auctions. There is no way to know what happened to the bass in between McCartney being photographed with it and it being purchased by John Bunning. Perhaps it was accidentally entered back into Selmer's stock. Was it stolen? We will never know. It's currently owned by Music Ground Shop in London. The only other bass McCartney is known to have played during his time with the Beatles is a Fireglow 1964 Rickenbacker 4001 bass, which Paul still retains to this day and played heavily on the later part of the Beatles recordings from Revolver onwards, as well as with Wings throughout the 1970s. Its Fireglow, or Red Sunburst finish, was then psychedelically changed into a dripping pattern in 1967, before he would then strip it down to the bare wood in 1969, which is how it remains today. Of course, Paul still owns this bass as well. As far as the fate of the original 1961 Hofner bass, Paul would use it famously later on the live promo for Revolution, with a rolled up bag tucked under the strings to deaden the sustain. He would also use it from time to time during the Let It Be, or Get Back sessions as they were known as at the time, along with his 1963 Hofner. When it came time for the rooftop concert, Paul would reach for the 63, placing a sticker that said Bassman on it for the show. The Let It Be sessions would be the last time anyone saw the 1961 Hofner. Unfortunately, that is where its story ends for now. No one, not even Paul himself, knows exactly when or how the base was misplaced or stolen. It can only be assumed that it disappeared sometime in the early 1970s, never to be seen again. No one has come forward with any information about the base. Hoffner themselves even have a page on their website titled The Lost Base, in which they offer the current owner to come forward anonymously without fear of repercussions from the law if they would reach out and turn over the base so that it could be returned to McCartney, its rightful owner. The 1961 Hofner violin bass, or 500-1, is the bass that started it all. It is the bass that drove the Beatles' sound in the early years. It's the bass that caught McCartney's eye at a time when he was just becoming a full-time player. Even though he would go on to use his 1963 Hofner over the previous 57 years, every instrument owner knows that there's nothing like your first one. Let's hope that this bass someday finds its way home and back into the hands of Paul McCartney so that it can make music once again. Thanks for watching another episode of If Guitars Could Speak. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to the Guitar Story and channel to see more content like this. We'll see you next time.